The derivative of e to the fifth plus one over the cube root of x squared plus 11 to the x. First thing I'm going to do is just rewrite the expression in brackets there. In particular, the second term, I'm going to rewrite one over the cube root of x squared as x to the negative two thirds. Uh, to get that, um, the two is the power, so that stays as the power. We have the cube root, the three becomes the denominator of the power. And to move it from the denominator to the numerator, we negate the exponent. Okay, now we're ready to take the derivative. The derivative of e to the fifth is just zero because e to the fifth is a constant. e is just a number, so e to the fifth is some other number. For the second one, we use the power rule. We bring down the negative two-thirds, and then we subtract one from the exponent. Negative two-thirds minus one, or negative two-thirds minus three-thirds is negative five-thirds. For this third one here, 11 to the x, it's nice to know the rule that the derivative of some number to the x is the same thing times the ln of that number. So the derivative of 11 to the x is 11 to the x times the ln of 11. If you're confused by that at all, I'm also going to show you how to do this using logarithmic differentiation as soon as we're finished simplifying this. Okay, so just to simplify a little, we don't need to write the zero. Here, x to the negative 5 thirds, we could write as 1 over because of the negative, the cube root because of the denominator, x to the fifth because the power is 5. Everything else I left the same. And that's the answer. So now, once again, if you were confused about how to get the derivative of 11 to the x, there are several ways. One is just to simply know the formula that the derivative of 11 to the x is 11 to the x ln 11. But if you forget that formula, you could use logarithmic differentiation, which we'll go through quickly now. If we set y equal to 11 to the x, we can go ahead and take the natural logarithm of each side. We get ln y equals ln 11 to the x. We could use a law of logarithms, which allows us to take the exponent x and move it out front. We now differentiate each side of this equation. Uh, we use an implicit differentiation on the left. The derivative of ln y is 1 over y times dy dx by the chain rule. And the derivative of a constant times x is just the constant. So x times ln 11, ln 11 is just a number. So x times that number, the derivative is just the number. We now multiply each side of the equation by y to get dy dx equals y ln 11. And finally, we replace y by what it's equal to. y is 11 to the x. So in place of y, we just put 11 to the x, and we have the derivative. The function k, whose graph consists of three line segments, is shown below. Which of the following are true for k on the open interval a, b? Okay, so let's go through each one one at a time. First one, limit as x goes to c, k of x exists. Well, if we look at the, the graph here, we see that the limit as x goes to c from the left is this value, this y value, and the limit as x goes to c from the right is equal to the same y value. So they're equal. Since the left-hand limit and right-hand limits are the same, uh, we know that the limit does in fact exist. So the first one is true. Now the second one, the domain of the derivative of k is the open interval cd. Well, the domain of the derivative is actually uh, quite a bit more than that. It's from A to C, together with from C to D, together with from D to B. The only places you have to exclude are where there's either a sharp edge, like here, right? When you have a sharp edge, you do not have differentiability. And here you have a discontinuity. So when you're differentiable, you have to be continuous. So the only places we are not differentiable are at C and at D, we're differentiable uh, on the open interval from A to C, the open interval from C to D, and the open interval from D to B. So the second one is false. The third one, the derivative of K is negative on the interval DB. Um, well, the function K is decreasing on DB, which means that the derivative is negative there. So that one is true. 
the slope of the tangent line to the curve x y to the fifth minus x cubed y to the fourth equal to 10 at negative two negative one is. Okay, so we're going to differentiate each side of this equation, starting with the uh, first product here, x times y to the fifth, we're gonna do a product rule. So the first is x times the derivative of y to the fifth is five y to the fourth times dy dx plus y to the fifth times the derivative of x, which is just one. Okay, now we go to the second term, the derivative of negative x cubed y to the fourth, another product rule. So we have negative x cubed times the derivative of y to the fourth, which is four y cubed times dy dx, plus y to the fourth times the derivative of negative x cubed, which is negative three x squared. And on the right-hand side, we just get zero because the derivative of the constant 10 is just zero. Now I'm gonna go ahead and plug in the point. Uh, so wherever I see an X, I'm putting a negative two, and wherever I see a Y, I'm putting a negative one. So X, negative two, there's a Y, negative one goes there, Y, negative one goes there, negative two for this X, negative one for the Y, Y, negative one, and in place of this X, a negative two. Notice we always use parentheses when substituting in negative values. Okay, now we'll just simplify this a little bit. Negative one to the fourth is positive one. Over here, negative one to the fifth is negative one. Negative two to the third is negative eight. Negative one to the third is negative one. Negative one to the fourth is positive one. And negative two squared is positive four. Okay, so over here we have negative two times five is negative 10 dy dx. This is minus one. And here we have a negative eight times four times negative one and a minus sign. There's three minus signs, so it stays negative. 8 times 4 is 32, dy dx, and negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. Okay, combining the like terms here, negative 10 dy dx and negative 32 dy dx gives negative 42 dy dx, and negative 1 and negative 12 add up to negative 13. Okay, bring the negative 13 over, in other words, add 13 to each side of the equation, and then divide by negative 42 to get. 13 over 42. So dy dx is negative 13 over 42. And that is the slope of the tangent line to the given curve. At which of the five points on the graph in the figure below is dy dx negative and d squared y dx squared positive? So we want to know when the first derivative is negative and the second derivative is positive. Well, the first derivative is negative where the function is decreasing. That happens at P and at T. At the other values, the function's increasing and the derivative is positive. So the answer is either P or T. Now, this, of those two, the function here is concave up at P and concave down at T. So since we want the second derivative to be positive, we need it to be concave up. So the answer is point P. If Y equals E to the KX, then D to the NY over DX to the N is equal to, okay, well, we're gonna to wanna to keep differentiating this until we see the pattern. So the derivative of E to the KX by the chain rule, it's E to the KX, that's the outer part of the chain, times the derivative of KX, which is just K. Okay, and then let's differentiate again. So the second derivative, is we'll leave the k where it is because it's a constant. And again, the derivative of e to the kx is e to the kx times, again, by the chain rule, another k. And that simplifies to k squared e to the kx. Okay, perhaps you could already see the pattern, but we'll do one more. The third derivative is k squared, leave the constant out. And then again, the derivative of e to the kx is e to the kx times another k. So that's k cubed e to the kx and so on. So I think we could see the pattern now. The nth derivative is k to the n times e to the kx. Two particles are moving along the x-axis. For t between 0 and 10, the position of particle a at time t is given by a of t equals 3 sine t, and the position of particle b at time t by b of t equals t cubed minus 12t squared plus 21t minus 1. For t between 0 and 10, 
find all times t during which the two particles travel in opposite directions. Okay, so we're going to take the derivatives of both of these expressions. The derivative of 3 sine t is 3 cosine t. And the derivative of t cubed minus 12t squared plus 21t minus 1 is 3t squared minus 24t plus 21. Just power rules there. Okay, just simplifying the second one, we could factor out a 3, and then we're left with t squared minus 8t plus 7. And then we could factor that further as t minus 1 times t minus 7, right? So we have t squared uh, minus 7t minus t is negative 8t, and negative 1 times negative 7 is 7. Okay, so now we set each of these equal to 0 to figure out at what times the particle is not moving at all where it stopped. So for the second one, which is a little easier, we could see immediately that one and seven are the two T values where the particle is not moving. For the first one, well, we could get rid of that three. We could divide it out and get cosine T equals zero. And when is cosine T zero? Well, from a standard graph of cosines, one way to figure it out, we could see at pi over two at three pi over two. And since cosine is periodic, this is gonna continue five pi over two, seven pi over two, nine pi over two, et cetera. But we only wanna pick the ones that are between zero and 10, right? So between zero and 10, well, pi over two and three pi over two and five pi over two are between zero and 10, right? Pi is a little more than three. So five pi over two is a little more than 15 halves or 7.5. 7 pi over 2 would be more than 21 over 2, which is certainly more than 10. So that would be too big. So there are only three t values here. Uh, next, we're going to look at the table. Uh, this We're going to put pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2 as our cutoff points. And we're also going to include 0 and 10 because those are the endpoints of the interval that we're interested in. And we're going to test a value inside each of these intervals to determine if the derivative is positive or negative. And we could use the graph to figure out those values pretty easily. For example, between 0 and pi over 2, um, I said let's test pi over 4. But you can see that the cosine is positive between 0 and pi over 2. So we put a little plus sign there. Between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, it's negative. It comes below the x-axis. Uh, then again, between 3 pi over 2 and 5 pi over 2, you can see here it's going to be positive, and it's going to repeat again after that. So then it's going to be negative uh, between 5 pi over 2 and 10. And now we'll do the same type of chart for the second function, right? Uh, a derivative chart here. So we have 0, 1, 7, and 10. The 1 and 7 come from these critical numbers here. And again, the 0 and 10 are because those are endpoints of the interval. We're just going to test numbers in each of these intervals back into the derivative. The easiest expression is the fully factored one here. So, for example, if I put 0.5 in here, I get a negative number times a negative number, which is positive. If I test the number 2, I get a positive number. 2 minus 1 is 1, which is positive. 2 minus 7 is negative 5, which is negative. Positive, positive, negative, that's going to be negative. And if I test a number between 7 and 10, such as 9, you see that everything's positive. 9 minus 1 is 8, which is positive. 9 minus 7 is 2, which is positive. Okay, So we have sign charts for both the function a and b. Um, really, they are derivatives. Right? And now I'm going to combine all this information into a single chart. So as the cutoff points here, I'm going to put all the numbers that appear in either uh, of these charts as, as cutoff points in order. So we have 0, 1. Now pi over 2, remember pi is a little bigger than 3, so pi over 2 is bigger than 1.5, so that's going to be larger than 1. Uh, of course, 3 pi over 2 is bigger than that. 3 times 3 is 9 over 2, 4.5, so this is probably somewhere around 5-ish, which is less than 7. And then 5 pi over 2 is uh, a little more than 15 over 2, right, which is certainly bigger than 7. And then 10 would come at the end. And let's just make sure, did we get all those numbers? 0, 1, 7, and 10 from here. Pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and 5 pi over 2. Great. And now I'm just going to copy these signs into the sign chart here. So between 0 and pi over 2, a prime is positive. So between 0 and pi over 2, right? So I put a positive both here and here because I'm going all the way from 0 to pi over 2. Then from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, it's negative. From 3 pi over 2 to 5 pi over 2, positive again. So I put positive here and here. 
and then from five pi over two to 10 is negative. And I'm gonna do the same thing for B. Between zero and one, I have a positive. Between one and seven, I have a negative. So one is over here. So negative, 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 all the way up to the seven. And then from seven to 10, positive. So I have positive here, positive here. Okay. Um, so just zooming in on that chart there, we're gonna pick out the three intervals we see where the signs are different because we're looking for where the particles travel in opposite directions. So A here, if we think of the right as the positive direction, A is going to the right between one and pi over two, and B is going to the left between one and pi over two. And similarly here we have plus minus, and here we have minus plus. So T between one and pi over two, T between three pi over two and seven, and T between five pi over two and 10, and we could include 10 there. And in interval notation, it would look like this, one pi over two, union three pi over two, seven, union five pi over two, 10, including 10, but not including any of the other uh, endpoints there. Okay, a bus is traveling on a straight road. For t between zero and 15 seconds, the bus's velocity, v of t, in feet per second is modeled by the function defined by the graph below. Let a of t be the bus's acceleration at time t in feet per second per second. For t between zero and 15, write a piecewise defined function for a of t. Right, so this is a graph of v of t, a of t is the derivative of v of t, so we're gonna be looking for the slopes of each of these line segments, right? So a of t, the first one, this slope is 35 minus zero over three minus zero, so that's 35 thirds. The second slope is just zero because it's a horizontal line, or 35 minus 35, zero over seven minus three, which is four. For the next one, it's negative 25 fourths, right? So we have 10 minus 35 is negative 25, and 11 minus 7 is 4. And for this last one, uh, negative 5 halves, right? So we have uh, 0 minus 10, and over 15 minus 11, which is negative 10 fourths, and that reduces to negative 5 halves. And um, the, the derivative here, a of t, does not exist at these points because there are sharp edges there. Sharp edges mean that you do not have differentiability.